everybody. Um, and we've had some interesting businesses described here this evening. We started off with um, the business that supported disputes, and we're finishing uh, with a business that supports disputes of a different kind. Um, litigation capital management um, is uh, an alternate asset manager. That's the way we think of ourselves. We invest into disputes globally. So we provide a capital source and some risk management tools uh, around large and complex commercial disputes. Uh, some of you may be familiar with um, some of our listed peers, Burford Wine Group, that's a large business predominantly in the US, but, but globally. We run a, a, a similar um, business to that. So we are investing into a range of disputes globally um, from um, insolvency restructuring based disputes, commercial disputes, which are litigated through the court systems, uh, all the predominantly common law jurisdictions. Um, then we move into the arbitral space, and we have experience right across that space from domestic through to international trade disputes, through to bilateral investment treaty disputes, through the class action space, and then into providing um, a, a, a product that services the corporate market, like large bundles of corporate disputes. Um, um, we are fortunate enough to have been one of the pioneers of this industry. This industry started in Australia back in the late 1990s. We were there on day one of this industry. So we came to the UK market um, having formerly been listed on the Australian Securities Exchange with a, a vast amount of experience in, in terms of predicting the outcome of a commercial dispute. Um, we um, run teams um, in Australia, in our home market of Australia, up into Asia, which is really servicing the Hong Kong and Singapore markets. Um, very strong in terms of arbitral disputes and trade disputes coming there. And we operate an office here in, um, in the UK, in London, and we're now listed on the AIM market. Um, <clears throat> we, we diversified our business um, in 2020 and the, and the capital structure of our business to focus upon funds management. So we're now into our second fund. We are um, managing just under 450 uh, million US dollars. That is all focused purely on, on disputes and investing in disputes. And <clears throat> we um, invest uh, both our balance sheet capital through direct investments um, together with the, um, the capital that we manage through our asset management business. And we run, a, we run a number of portfolios of disputes. Um, some, of the, um, some of them are single case investments. In other words, we invest into the outcome of a single dispute. Some of the, them are portfolio investments where we will invest in a bundle of disputes for a corporate or for a law firm. And we will also participate in the acquisition of claims. So we will actually buy the claim from the claimant and then we'll run that through to, to a profitable outcome. In terms of um, the business model that we're currently running, we're running a co-investment model. So we're using 75% of the capital commitment comes out of our asset management or our funds management business, and 25% of the capital commitment in respect of each investment comes from our balance sheet. And it's through that mechanism that not only can we leverage um, the large portfolio that we are able to manage at any particular time using third party capital, but we can enhance the returns that we generate from those disputes. And the type of investors that we have managed to attract, um, given our track record and success, are large US based um, university endowments, um, UK and, U and, and European pension funds, um, global investment banks and family offices. So we've been very fortunate to be able to attract the very best sort of blue chip investors in, into our funds management business. And in terms of um, how we generate a, a return or how we generate um, our revenue, we get paid one of two ways, either a multiple of the invested capital at the outcome of that dispute, and that, that multiple invested capital is indexed over time. And, and through that mechanism, we can push the risk in terms of um, duration risk back onto the party that we are funding. So often if these uh, particular disputes get um, bound up in the court system for longer, it actually often enhances the returns that we're able to generate um, with respect to this model. And alternatively, we will charge uh, a percentage of the pool of capital that we've helped to create through the source of our capital and our risk management and our assistance in the terms of the management 
um, of those disputes. Um, I want to just to sort of make this a bit real for everyone, just sort of talk about one of the investments which we recently um, um, invested in and funded. And this was in relation to, to a building construction company, which many of you will be familiar with here in the United Kingdom, the Carillion Group of Companies. That was the largest ever failure of a building construction company in the United Kingdom. Um, we provided the capital and the risk management around the claim which was brought against the auditors um, of the Carillion Group. And you can see there that the, the metrics that we were able to generate um, in respect of that. So if you're looking at a return on invested capital based upon the actual performance of that investment, you know, that generated 140%. Um, <clears throat> if you look then across the metrics down there, um, you know, it generated an IRR of 79%. And then if you look across using the blended model, it generated much, much larger when we were leveraging third party capital. So that's the type of dispute that we would get involved in in the um, insolvency and restructuring space. And if we think about, you know, what's happening now in the markets, in the UK, you've got um, insolvencies at a 65 to 75 year high. So we're getting, a, and we, getting and we expect to get a lot more of these opportunities coming out of insolvency. Um, so what's, how, does this, um, how does this investment strategy perform over a period of time? So if you take the last 12 years and measure every single investment that LCM has made over that period, irrespective of the source of capital that we've got, inclusive of losses, on a portfolio basis that's generated an internal rate of return um, of 78% and a multiple invested capital of somewhere between sort of 2.6 and 2.7 times. So it's an investment strategy which has the capability of generating you know, really strong returns. Now, if we, look at, if we look at this slide, we've chopped up our performance into rolling three-year blocks here. And what, why we've done that is because we sort of have endeavoured to steer investors in the direction of our investments having a life of about 36 to 42 months going forward. Now, if we look at that historically, um, over the last 12 years, it's actually been 29 months. But if you, if you think about it going forward as being 36 months, these are the type of performance metrics that we're able to generate running this strategy on, on a three-year rolling basis. So we, I often get asked about, um, as we sort of scale up this business and as we became a public company, will we be able to maintain um, the performance that we've, we've been able to maintain historically? So <clears throat> at the beginning of this chart was 2016. That's when we listed on the Australian Securities Exchange. And then 2018 is when we shifted our listing up here um, to the London market. And we've been able to maintain um, really strong performance um, right across that period um, of being public and scaling this business. And just to give you a sort of sense of the size of LCM, so in our last, um, last year's performance, we had revenue of 181 million on a consolidated basis. That generated a net profit before tax of just under 40 million. And we were able to achieve that with a staff of 22 people globally. Um, so, you know, we're, we're a small and dynamic um, team, um, but we, you know, work hard at really sort of generating some really quite buoyant returns. Um, <clears throat> I just want to sort of touch upon some of the reasons why um, someone might look at this sort of asset class, and in particular LCM, as something to invest in um, in the current market conditions. So the first one is, is that the underlying investments which we are making using you know, our balance sheet capital as well as our funds management business are all totally uncorrelated to the wider market. Now, whilst our share price <coughs> itself might be correlated, the actual performance of these underlying investments are utterly uncorrelated. So if you think about what we're investing in, we're investing in a dispute between two commercial parties. That dispute, if it can't be negotiated on a commercial basis between those parties, will be adjudicated by a court or a tribunal. And that judge doesn't say, OK, we've got a conservative government in now, I'm going to decide this decision this way, or we've got a war going on, or we're in a recession. They apply the law, and in that respect, every single investment we make is utterly uncorrelated to what's happening in the wider investment um, or economic or geopolitical. Um, 
So, and, and the second point about the uncorrelated nature is every single individual investment which, which comprises part of our portfolio is itself uncorrelated to everything else because they all rely upon a different substratum of facts and a different application of the law. So you have this um, incredibly um, <coughs> attractive proposition that irrespective of what might happen in wider markets, irrespective of whether we might go into a recession, the underlying investments that we invest in will be just adjudicated applying the law and they won't be otherwise affected. The second, um, the second aspect of this business that I think is worth touching upon is that it tends to be counter-cyclical. So if we think about where we are in the cycle, and people may have different opinions about this, but we've come out of COVID, hopefully. Um, we've come out into you know, high inflation. We've got interest rates climbing in an effort to bring that under control. Um, you know, a week or 10 days ago, I would have said, we've got, you know, one, we're in one war, now we're in two wars. Uh, we've got you know, supply lines disrupted as a consequence of that and as a consequence of COVID. We're not really entirely sure whether this economy that we're in here or the US economy or the Australian economy is going to have a soft or hard landing. I think the one thing that we can all probably say is that no one really knows what's going to happen a month away, six months away or a year away. And it's in those types of economic conditions, the uncertainty associated with those markets, which tends to drive demand for our capital. So if you think about you know, the two, the two bookends of the market that we face and that we invest into. One of them is insolvency and restructuring. As I said before, numbers are very significantly up to what they've been before. So I think here in the UK, we're at a 65 to 75 year high in respect of those numbers. That provides tremendous opportunity for us. If you look right to the other end of the spectrum and you look to you know, large and sophisticated corporate entities, why would they use our capital at the moment? because they want to put their capital towards their core business. They're cutting their budgets in respect of non-core items such as spending on disputes. So these types of market conditions tend to favour our industry and in particular LCM's business. Um, we've got incredibly low market penetration across the markets in which we operate. Depending on which survey you take, you know the Australian market and the UK market, we've got penetration of somewhere between 3 and 7%. So there's an enormous amount of the market which remains unaddressed by our industry. Um, we've got growing market demand generally, so surveys say that there's more and more people thinking about using an external source of capital to fund their disputes and to take on that risk. Um, we've also got um, a shift in our business um, leaning towards the asset management. So we're starting to use more and more external sources of capital, and through that we can generate um, performance fees and, and really leverage the outcome of these, these um, returns that we're able to, to, um, to achieve using this strategy. And secondly, in respect of our balance sheet capital, we can diversify our risk across many more disputes than what we would have originally if we were funding 100% from our own capital. And we've got a shifting legal market and the dynamics of the legal market. So I think anyone who's been involved in a dispute and had the misfortune of having to retain lawyers to provide legal services to them know that it's an incredibly expensive and intensive exercise and it does drain your resources. So the opportunity for large corporates to use an external source of capital is an incredibly attractive thing, particularly in the type of market conditions that we're seeing currently. Um, so <clears throat> where are we at in terms of LCM's um, evolution and our growth? And I think when I think about one of these businesses, I think about sort of you know, three essential elements that are necessary to be um, profitable. And the first one is probably pretty obvious. The first one is you need to develop the methodologies and the skill set to be able to take a given set of facts, apply the law and predict the outcome. And that is not something necessarily that a disputes lawyer does intuitively. Typically, they're very bad at that. So <clears throat> typically, a, a disputes lawyer will understand the legal principles, but will have no notion about the commerciality of, of running a dispute and running a dispute efficiently. And they're not motivated to do so, given they charge by the hour. So we're fortunate enough to have been around. We've been doing this for 25 years, so we've developed um, the methodologies to really undertake that exercise, that underwriting of risk, that intensive due diligence process really, really well. And 
It's not something you can go and buy off the shelf. It's something you can only get through sleepless nights and worrying about the investments you've made and through bitter experience. And we get better all the time. So if you think about the skill set, the methodology, the systems necessary, our track record suggests we're pretty good at that. The second element that you really need essentially to run one of these businesses um, properly is a proper source of capital. So in 2020, we diversified our capital structure. We brought in um, our asset management, our funds management division, and that really gave us a much larger pool of capital to diversify the risk of our portfolios make, you know, and build bigger portfolios. It's pretty capital intensive, these businesses, like the budgets that we are typically seeing in respect of large commercial disputes range from about sort of four or five million through to 30 million in respect of a single dispute. So in respect of the capital component of this business, um, we're again fortunate enough to have, you know, the very best blue chip investors in our funds management business. They have entrenched rights in respect of our third, fourth and fifth fund. So provided that we can continue to underwrite the risk of these investments and perform well, we should have a pretty much unlimited supply of capital to continue to build this business. Which brings us really to the third element or the third essential element of one of these businesses, which is if you want to take the skills that you've learnt and the capital that you've managed to attract and generate the sort of returns that we've been able to generate historically, you need a really strong origination platform. In other words, you need to get access to the best possible disputes globally, which we can invest in. And that's really the juncture that we're at in terms of this business, is that we're expanding our origination platform to really give us access to the best quality disputes, which you know, we believe, in terms of undertaking that underwriting process, are most likely to succeed and generate the returns that we have managed to achieve um, historically. Um, so that brings me, with four minutes to spare, um, to um, questions, and I suspect um, People have some questions about this industry. It's um, less usual than perhaps real estate. Sorry, we've got any questions for Patrick? One just at the back there to start things off. Hi, uh, thanks for confusing me. <laughs> How do you source your clients? So do they come to you or are you advertising in some way? We don't advertise, but um, really what you're doing is you're forming a relationship with <coughs> law firms and the very best law firms that you can possibly form a relationship with. It's those law firms that are providing legal services into, into the large disputes that are happening in the market. Secondly, you're forming relationships with insolvency practitioners. So if you think about what an insolvency practitioner does, that insolvency practitioner is appointed to an insolvent corporate shell. They typically don't have much money in that corporate shell. They're looking for a way to bring in capital, pursue assets which might have been you know, put sideways, pursue claims which might be resident inside that shell, haven't got a capital source, so they're looking to us. So it's very much relationship driven, and it's not about advertising, it's going out there and forming a relationship and providing a good service. Excellent. Um, and we had another question over here. So what percent of your disputes do you actually win? And do you have any qualms about the disputes you get involved in? <coughs> well, so I'll, finish, I'll start with the second bit, any qualms. I mean, we, we are pretty conscious of who we're prepared to back in respect of these. So um, the use of litigation finance um, is a great Level of, level of the playing field. So if you're, if you're in a David and Goliath type dispute, and this happens routinely when you've got a class action, you know, that, you know, the provision and backing of litigation finance and the risk management and helping to manage that dispute all the way through does level the playing field. So I don't think we have any qualms. We, we're not providing um, capital to fund disputes for big tobacco or anything like this. So I think we're pretty comfortable in terms of who we're backing. So we're doing a lot, um, a lot of class actions in and around environmental degradation. Um, so I think we're pretty comfortable with that. In terms of success rate, I think we now since inception have um, funded something in the order of 260 separate disputes through to conclusion and we're managing a portfolio of 50 or 60 disputes now. In respect of completed stuff, I think we've suffered a financial loss in 13, maybe, 13, 12 or 13, so less than 5%. So you don't do any medical disputes or 
No, so I mean, this, the type of stuff that we do, they're typically large commercial disputes or class actions. So we're not in personal injury, we're not in matrimonial disputes. Anything that has emotion in it, we kind of want to be somewhere else. <laughs> Got another question just up here. Uh, just, just if you just wait for one second, sir, sorry, just while we get the microphone over to you. No, that's fine, no problem. Yes, who are your biggest competitors? Is that mainly Australia or UK? Or? So um, I, think, I think it depends upon which part of the market we face. So if I start with, with providing capital to large corporates, they're probably our competitor. So that corporate is saying, should I use an external source of capital or should I use my own? So I'm competing really against their own capital base. Um, if I look across the balance of the market, Depends on which market we're talking about, um, but you know, there's private litigation funds set up here in the UK. We're seeing a bit of consolidation in the market in the UK at the moment, so a couple of the larger players are moving out of the sector. Um, so interestingly, you know, if you think about our two listed competitors, there's Burford, who's dual listed um, on the A market and the New York Stock Exchange. Interestingly, we don't really compete with them. So in the time I've been in this business for 20 years, which obviously predates Burford, I think there might have only been three occasions where we've really come up against them. Omni Bridgeway, listed on the Australian market, um, was there on day one with us. We compete with them a bit in the Australian market, not so much here in the UK, and we compete with them in the Asian market. So it's... it's um, the, the, the market penetration in respect to litigation finance is remarkably low. So. I think that when I think about competition, I don't think about that taking opportunities away. I really think about that as an opportunity to spread the word about the product. Excellent. Um, any further questions? In which case, I've got a couple, if that's okay, Patrick. So I wondered sure. how many of the cases or litigation that you take on is kind of settled before you come to a conclusion? Yeah, so... so um, <clears throat> Historically, last time we did these numbers, which I think was um, just prior to 2020, of the resolved um, disputes that we had invested in up until that time, it was something north of 95% had resolved themselves through commercial negotiation yeah. as opposed to being adjudicated by the court. And that's something that, that we would really welcome. I mean, mm. we, we want this stuff to resolve itself through a commercial negotiation <laughs> because it takes the uncertainty out of it. Yeah, that makes sense. And I mean, you mentioned it's quite, a, it's 22 people, did you say, on the team? Is that yeah. right? So quite a small team, but presumably quite a sort of people-centred business because you talked about that experience being really important in terms of underwriting the, the risks involved. So I wonder how much of a challenge it is to retain people and kind of attract new people into the business. Yeah, so, so it's, it's not very hard at all to right. attract people and it's not very hard to keep them. So my background is I'm a legal practitioner. I was admitted to practice in Australia 25 years ago. Um, I was pretty keen to transition out of disputes, which is what I'd practiced all my life. And the reason why I was keen to move out of disputes was that I kind of liked the intellectual rigor associated with taking the facts and applying the law and seeing if I was right or wrong. That was, that was a challenge and it was interesting and it was, you know, it was something I wanted to do. What I didn't want to do is spend my late nights and weekends preparing affidavits and doing all of the hard work associated with litigation, which is less glamorous. And I think if I was to ask the investment managers, which you know, really form the engine room of this business, yeah. they're all pretty much the same. They want to come across and do the stuff they like in terms of litigation and, and escape from the stuff that they don't. Sure. Um, and so it's really not very hard. Like if you have a position available to, for people to come across from, from a disputes background, you tend to get overwhelmed with applications. That's interesting. And in terms of kind of litigation as an asset class, do you think it's kind of hard to kind of explain it to people and also to have that kind of transparency with it because I guess some stuff is protected by, you know, confidentiality and, you know, does, do you think that's a factor in terms of the way these kind of businesses are valued by the market? Well, I, d I did a bad job because the gentleman down there said he was more confused than when I started, so <laughs> that, that, that was a bit tricky. I mean, I, I, think, um, I think people when they think about litigation, are naturally repelled um, from litigation. So I think it's hard to get people sort of engaged in, in thinking about a dispute as, as a vehicle for an investment. Um, so, but I think 
once you get over that, it's a remarkably simple business. Yeah. I mean, we're either good at what we do. It's, no dis it's not dissimilar to anyone putting together a portfolio of investments. We just happen to do it in the disputes arena, and it just sure. happens to be our skill set. Great. Can there was a question just here. Can you envisage a day when risk in disputes will be minimised by artificial intelligence? Yeah, so we're, we're, um, we're, not, we're nowhere near there yet. So there's still a very large um, human element associated with this. Um, you can sort of see bits and pieces of AI starting to come into this, but ultimately the resolution of disputes is always going to require advocacy and an adjudicator and what have you. And, you know, disputes are, you know, they're large business. They're large business for lawyers and there's really, really large amounts of money being argued about, um, you know, across the globe at any one particular time. Like if I look at the spend in the US in respect of disputes, it's north of sort of 450 billion per annum. Um, it's a lot of money to spend in, in terms of disputes on lawyers. Um, but there will come a day where some of the work that we currently do in a manual sense will be done through artificial intelligence, but there's always going to be a place for having that intuitive understanding of how something will travel through a court system and what the pitfalls might be and what have you. Excellent. Um, we've got a question, the gentleman just behind. Do you restrict any of these disputes to particular categories? Sorry, can I just... Well, do you have a... If you've got a portfolio, you usually have different categories or classifications. Yep. Do you yep. have any rules for, for that? For yeah, absolutely. So, so when we build a portfolio of disputes, we're doing a very similar thing to what you might do in terms of investments. We don't want all of our capital in one basket. So we're diversifying that through industry sector, through jurisdiction, through territory, through claim type. So when we put a portfolio together, it'll have some insolvency claims, it'll have some straightforward commercial contractual disputes, it'll have some class actions, it'll have some competition claims in London, it'll have arbitrations coming out of Singapore, out of Paris and what have you. So it'll be a complete mix. And every single one of those disputes, which we think about as investments, will be utterly uncorrelated to the next because there'll be a different story, there'll be a bit different substratum of facts, and there'll be a different application of the law, and it'll be in a different jurisdiction. Um, so we actively seek to ensure that we have diversity across a portfolio, and secondly, that it's not suffering from concentration risk. So we're not out there placing really large investments or large bets in respect of a single dispute. We, we, we are trying to diversify our risk across a, a, an even portfolio. Excellent. Um, any more questions? Just a final one from me then. In terms of um, jurisdictions that you were talking about, do you kind of limit yourself in terms of the jurisdictions you would look at? Because I guess, you know. Yeah, so, so we're we, we, um, <clears throat> pretty keen on sticking to our knitting. So yeah. we're looking for common law jurisdictions. You know, it, it, we have um, a presence and offices in the, in the major cities in Australia. We'll fund up into New Zealand, we'll fund up into Singapore, into Hong Kong, and then arbitrations, depending upon what the law is that we might source out of the Middle East, and then up into London. Now, if you think about all of those jurisdictions, all common law jurisdictions, they all really come from the same source law, which was English law. So they're all things that we are familiar and jurisdictions we're familiar with. So we're hesitant about anything in the US. We haven't got boots on the ground in the US. Maybe we will one day, but we tend not to make investments into a particular jurisdiction or territory unless we understand that from you know, a cultural basis as well. So there's a particular culture to the law across these jurisdictions. Unless you know that, you can get yourself in all sorts of trouble. And it sounds like you've got quite a lot to go after in, in those jurisdictions anyway, yeah. so it's not like you need to, to move outside of those. Yeah. Um,